I was thinking about that song today, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And I wonder how well we do that. I know this week I was talking to my uh, daughter and family and, you know, and the discussion is all about COVID and all that stuff going on. And, and I told her, well, I'm not afraid to die, you know, and I really, I feel like that. I don't know when the time comes, how I'll do, but I think it'll be okay, you know. Uh, and of course they were saying, well, we're not ready for you to die yet. And, but, um, you know, and that's well and good because I, I when it's kind of a selfish thing, but and then Kathy wasn't feeling too good later on this week, earlier this week, and I was thinking, well, I'm not ready for her to die. <laughs> you know, it's always the other person. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, we have to grapple with a lot of those things to really look full in the face of Jesus and trust him with our lives, don't we? Whatever, whatever we are dealing with. So, uh, amen? amen? Yeah. So, okay. Well, hopefully you found your way to John chapter 12. I have a few important announcements to make a little later on, but for now, uh, we'll turn there and hopefully just dig into God's word there. Um, so John chapter 12, Jerry read it for us. Um, it's really, it happens about halfway through what we call the Passion Week of Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John spend a lot of time in each of their Gospels on this Passion Week, the week of Christ's suffering. And I was reading a commentary, and in there it, it talks about the fact that the temple was packed with people from all over the country. They had come there to uh, worship. Uh, they had come there for Passover. And so you can imagine the temple full of people. Uh, Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on Monday. So his famous palm branches waving, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, probably happened on Monday of that week. Uh, this was the time when Jesus' hour had come. So that was Monday. On Tuesday, uh, he attacked the temple. He, got, he was cleaning out the temple. He was clearing away the money changers, the, the greedy uh, merchants who were making uh, the temple into a marketplace. And then there are some events that take, that was Tuesday, on Wednesday and Thursday, he does some teaching. Uh, so he is doing some instruction and training and teaching. And then on Friday is the day that he was crucified. It was, it, all the trials went on during the night. And on Friday, uh, of course, is when he was crucified. So, uh, and in between there, at some point, Jesus is making this final invitation to the people of Israel, to the nation. And so this is a very important, uh, very important, it's the last um, invitation, the final invitation that Jesus gives to the nation of Israel and to the people at the time. And so in chapter 12, verse 44, it says that Jesus cried out. It actually means that Jesus called out. Uh, I think that Jesus was literally offering for the last time the opportunity to believe in him. It was the last opportunity that he would have. From this time on, Jesus doesn't, is not involved in any public ministry. After this, it's all private ministry leading up to his trials and uh, his crucifixion. So... Um, and so chapter 12, verse 44, let me get over there. Um, and Jesus cried out. Jesus called out. Jesus gave the final invitation, really here is what it says. 
and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. Jesus was inviting them to faith in him, and he was declaring that he is the exact image, the exact representation of the Father. So that when you see me, you see the Father. If you believe in me, then you believe in him who sent me. That has been his message all through the Gospel of John. In John 1, 18, we read a long time ago, no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has exegeted him. He has explained him. He has demonstrated by who he is in the incarnation. He has explained the, who God is. Colossians 1.15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the image. He is the icon. He is the exact image of the Father. When you see Jesus, you see the Father. When you believe the teachings and the words of Jesus, you are believing the one who sent him. There's no difference, no distinction between Jesus and the Father. Hebrews 1.3 says, And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So to believe in Jesus is therefore to believe in God. Um, they are not two separate objects of faith. When one sees Jesus, he sees the Father who sent him. Um, so Jesus came, his purpose, his purpose in coming, of course, was to um, lead people, to lead us out of darkness. His purpose is to lead people out of darkness, out of the darkness of sin, out of the darkness of separation from God, out of the darkness of ignorance, out of the darkness in general. He came, his purpose was to lead people out of Satan's kingdom and into the kingdom of God, into the kingdom of light. John 1, 4 and 5 says, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So the light shines in the darkness. John 1, 9 through 11 says, There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him. Um, John chapter 8, verse 12, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. <laughs> he who follows me will not walk in darkness. This is really important stuff. He will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus is the light of the world. And then in chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus says, for a little while. That's why I'm thinking this is the last invitation that Jesus would give to the, to the world in his day, to the nation of Israel. Jesus said to them, for a little while longer, verse 35, the light is among you. The light is among you for a little while. And right after this, guess what happens? Jesus hides himself from them. This is it. This is the last call, the last invitation. So um, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have the light so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. That is a scary 
place to be in the darkness, isn't it? Um, and then Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says, For he rescued us, believers, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So um, his purpose, Jesus' purpose in coming, what is Jesus all about? It is to lead people out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the darkness and into the light so that they will know where they're going. They will know uh, the journey and what's ahead. So um, we have through him, we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Amen? Amen. That's a good thing. He who believes in me does not believe in me who sent him. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. So Jesus is the light. He said, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus is concerned that people not remain in darkness. I'll get to that in a minute. So Jesus does not want anyone to remain in darkness. We are called to be co-laborers with God. The question often comes, or I've read the question many times, what about the heathen? What about the people who grow up in uh, countries where the gospel is not so readily available? What about the Hindu nations of the world? What about the Buddhist nations of the world? What about the Muslim hordes of people who ascribe to Islam? What about them? You know, what is their fate? If they don't know Jesus, if they do not know him as Savior, there is no redemption. There is no redemption. It says in uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is no other name under heaven. Under heaven. It's not, there's no other name in Christian America. It's there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved than Jesus. Uh, so, what do you do with that? I would just say that we are called to be co-laborers with God. I have a picture in my mind. I've shown it here before a few times. But there was a picture when Kathy and I went to Nepal, and we were not going as missionaries. We were going there to check out Alicia's future husband, and that was pretty much it. <laughs> so we didn't go there to win souls for Christ, but... We did, though. Uh, I went trekking with Florian, and Kathy went trekking with Alicia, and trekking, it was incredible, three weeks. I love to be able to do it again, but um, we got up really early. We had packed uh, our bags, our burlap sacks with Bibles and tracts and all kinds of things, and we got up early, packed our backpacks, and went down to meet with a taxi, uh, and then we got in this taxi and drove a long ways to a drop-off point. And I think, I don't remember who got off first, but was it you guys? So Kathy and Alicia got off first. And they were just kind of out there by themselves. And then Florian and I went further and we got off in another spot. And it was all planned. And we started hiking up the <clears throat> foothills of the Himalayas there. And don't, don't think that it was a big mountain climbing experience it wasn't but it was incredibly beautiful and you know and uh, we would just go because cities here if you drive into a town around here they're all flat so you just you drive in and here's the outskirts of the city and then you drive through the city and you get out the other side and pretty much all on one level right but over there you start here and then you go through the city this way and then keep going up and so that's kind of what it was like. Uh, and so at one point, and I have a picture of this, uh, Florian and I were just hiking together, getting acquainted, and uh, I think he was getting acquainted with me. I, I never had a problem with Florian at all, so I just think God's choice was good. So 
anyway, um, so I just remember there was this young man, probably about, I don't know, 25, 30, and he was walking down this hillside, and I remember the picture of a ping. You guys know what a ping is? It's a swing made out of bamboo poles in Nepal. And I mean, those guys, they really swing. It's called a ping. So I remember that, but I remember this young man herding two or three black, I don't know if they were oxen or cows, but they were coming down the hill and he was herding them. And I just remember Florian taking the gospel and walking over to that guy who he had met and talking to him and I, I didn't speak Nepali, Florian could speak Nepali, and they had a long conversation and he gave him a tract and he explained how to get, how he, he told him about Jesus. And here was a young man who had never in his life heard the name Jesus. He had, it had never, he had never heard it, ever. And, uh, so that man had the opportunity to think about and to uh, learn about the Lord Jesus and his sacrifice. So all I'm saying is that um, we are called to go. We are called to pray. We are called to give. I, I will just say that someday when we stand, when I stand before the Lord, I think he will ask me, I think he will ask us whether we were involved, whether we cared, whether we were missionaries in our hearts toward people who have never heard in this world. I mean, I, I really think he will ask us about that. And I would personally like to start a prayer group in our church when all we do, because we always run out of time on Tuesdays, just to pray for our missionaries and continue to pray for them. It just seems like there's so many things and it kind of gets shoved off to the side. But I think we, our heart should be toward them and toward the ministry of the gospel. Um, we should give a large part of our budget every month, every year, is goes towards... Uh, supporting missionaries in our church. It has forever. Um, so I would just say the answer to that is go, pray, give, love. We also need to live in a way that adorns the gospel of Christ. Titus chapter 2 and verse 7 through 10. Just look at that. This is how to be a missionary. This is really an important way to be a missionary by not doing anything you know, except living a godly life. Look at Titus, uh, Paul's letter to the pastors, we learned. Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. He says, uh, verse 6, Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be submissive to their masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that, here it is, there will, they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. You want to be a missionary? Read that. Let your life be conformed to the truth of the Word of God. You don't have to go to Nepal. You have to live a godly life here. It has to do with your marriage. It has to do with the way that you treat your children. It has to do with the way you go to work. It has to do with the way you conduct your life. And it says that we, in every way, we ought to be adorning. Uh, I think making beautiful the doctrine of God. 
And we can do the opposite of that by being jerks. Spiritual jerks. Sorry if that's too... So can I. You guys are awful quiet here. <laughs> Sorry. So God, in John chapter 12, let's go back there because John, in, in this passage of Scripture, God drops the curtain on the nation of Israel. This was Jesus' last public invitation, and he was, um, and so this is the end. This is the, uh, the curtain falling, the last invitation. The sun of righteousness is setting on the nation of Israel. The scriptures tell us, however, that God is merciful, right? I mean, when you read this, you might think, well, okay, God is merciful. I know that. But he really is. God is compassionate. God is long-suffering. God is slow to anger. God is extremely patient with sinners. I don't know that we always are, but God is. <clears throat> and um, just read the, the life of Jesus. Watch his life. Watch how he adorned the doctrine. Uh, watch, uh, this is kind of a new phrase to me, you'll hear it a lot, but Jesus had a yes face. He had a yes face. I think when he looked at people, it said yes. It wasn't scowling. It wasn't sour like being weaned on a dill pickle. I think he loved people. He did not condone sin, but he loved people. He just did. And and uh, so I think that's really important. God is patient. God is gracious. Are you? God is long-suffering. Are you? God is slow to anger. Are you? God is extremely patient with sinners. Are you? Good questions, right? So, um, <clears throat> and 2 Peter 3, 9 just says, The Lord is not slow. Sometimes we think God is slow, but the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So, um, but we can read in the Bible some hard things. Sometimes when God's patience came to an end, when the curtain dropped, when judgment fell, and we kind of read those things, and sometimes we skip over the patience of God, but even in the book of Genesis, uh, where it says in Genesis 6, 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. This is such a compounding of terminology here. I, I think that Moses is trying to describe the world in the days of Noah with words, and he couldn't find enough words to describe the fallen, wicked nature that had developed on the earth. But he says, Then the Lord God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How's that for a mouthful? That was God's analysis of the way the world was at that stage. And then in chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, it says, Now the earth was corrupt, in the sight of God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. And so all I'm saying is, if you read back then, the curtain came down on the world at that time. It started to rain. Um, the flood came. The people drown. God's judgment fell. And John, uh, Genesis 6, 3 says, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. What is that about? Well, even at the time of the judgment of the flood, which is terrible, I mean, we, it's just terrible. The judgment of God that fell upon the corruption, upon the wickedness, 
upon the evil that happened as God looked down on the earth, even then, God says in Genesis 6-3 that his days shall be 120 years. Even then, God was gracious. Even then, as Noah constructed the ark, he, it took him, it's a long building project. Some of you know about projects that take a long time. <laughs> um, it, it took a long time. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Jean? Is, is you looking at Dennis? <laughs> she, might, she might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it won't take whatever it is, 120 years. But <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Noah was building, hammering, sawing, planning, building an ark for 120 years. And he was preaching that a flood is coming. He was preaching by building that judgment was coming, that the flood would come, that the people were in peril. So even in the judgment, there was 120 years of grace before God put the hammer down. But judgment eventually comes. Judgment for sin eventually does come. And um, it always comes. And it will come, one commentator told, says, it will come on our nation. It has come on other nations. It has come on many other nations. For some reason, God's favor has rested with Israel, but every nation, they rise, they fall, they rise, they fall, judgment eventually comes. And uh, Jesus says in John 8, 12, then I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So, um, John 8, verse 24 says, Therefore I said to you that you will die, you will die in your sins, for unless you believe, unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Judgment will come. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. And then suddenly Jesus went away. We read it in the text. Look at John chapter 12. Um, so, verse 35 of John 12 says, And Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Just think of him making this loud statement for a little while. Yes, a very little while. A little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light. That's his last public words. Really, that's his last invitation before the curtain fell. It says, while you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. That's an invitation. That is a calling people to faith, to belief. And then in the middle of that verse, it says, these things Jesus spoke and he went away and hid himself from them. That's it. The curtain is down. The sun has set. The opportunity for faith is past. Um, so, Jesus, uh, this is what Jesus was doing in this passage. Let's look again. Um, verse uh, 46. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. I think I missed a little bit of what I was going to say about that. Well, Let's keep going. Um, if anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, I do not judge him. 
for I did not come to judge, to condemn the world. I did not come in my incarnation in the first visit. I did not come to condemn the world. I did not come to judge the world. If people think that Jesus came to condemn the world, he came to provide life. He came to provide hope. He came to, to, to bring life where there was death and to bring light where there was darkness and he came to lead people into the abundant life. All of those things are true. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. And so he says, he who rejects me does not receive my sayings. And he has one who judges him. The word, uh, sorry, the word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. I'm going to say there will be a time in the future when the hammer comes down, when the curtain comes down, when Jesus comes back as judge. We all know that. Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne, when the dead, the dead, the great sea of the dead will come and stand before the judge and they will experience then the condemnation of unbelief uh, at that time. So um, verse 49 says, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Jesus' life was directed by the Father. Even what Jesus taught was directed by the Father. He spoke what he heard from the Father. There's no difference between the Son and the Father. He just said that um, the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. In verse 50, I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. So these are the last final, uh, in the last invitation of Jesus at that time. Um, So what are some of the principles in this passage? I just wrote down a few. Number one, the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. Um, in, in our day, the church made up of individual Jews, individual Gentiles who are in Christ, who have believed on Christ, who have become part of the church, part of the, the body of Christ, uh, we are told in 1 Timothy, Paul said that, that the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. So um, Jesus has left. He's left us with the Holy Spirit. And now we are, the church is, the body of Christ is the pillar upholding the truth and the support of the truth. So this is a very, very important idea. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. Uh, sorry, did I say 1 Timothy? Mm -hmm. It might be 2 Timothy. I don't know. Sometimes I do that. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. All right. No. I was pretty sure I first Timothy three five is what I put. It. I will find it, okay? We're not in a hurry here, okay? I know the the roast is not burning at home. Wow. Come on, you guys. Some of you should know where this is. I can't. I'm, I found it earlier, but I didn't write down the right verse. What are you after? It's where the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. I, that's all. First Timothy 3.15. Is that it? Yeah, thank you. That was it. Thank you, Dick. That was good. 
I had I just didn't I forgot a one there. So um, look at chapter uh, chapter three and verse um, fourteen. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. Paul said that to Timothy. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So that's the job description of the truth. The truth is our faith, the faith once for all uh, handed to the saints, delivered to the saints. So the church now is the pillar and the support of the truth. The truth is what is real. I've said this a hundred times. The truth is what is real. Um, to know and to follow the truth is really important, right? If you were in Awana, um, Jesus is the source of truth. Satan is the source of lies. And uh, so the church is the pillar and the support of the truth. So our job as a church is to teach children, not just children, to teach youth, to teach families, and to teach seniors what is the truth, what is the truth of the Word of God. That's really a, a really important thing that we can never uh, forget. That's our job description. Number two, God is patient towards sinners. God is patient toward sinners. Sinners, was God patient with you? Was God patient with you? Yeah. How patient was he? Very patient, you know. At some point, believers in Christ came to faith. But just think of all the years before that, when God was patient with you, waiting for you. Uh, and... Uh, so God is patient towards sinners. And then the third thing is that his patience, however, will run out. You cannot read the New Testament without understanding that there is judgment coming. There is a day coming when God will judge those unbelievers, those who are outside of his, uh, who have rejected him. Uh, Revelation 20, 2 Thessalonians 1. That's the, one of the most scary passages in all of the scripture. You want to look at it? Sure you do. <laughs> Why not? Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. But I mean, if you think that the hammer will never fall, the hammer will fall. The curtain will come down on those who don't know Christ. It will. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, beginning with, I'll just begin with verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because you, your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each of you, each one of you, toward one another grows ever greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God, for your perseverance and faith. And in the midst of your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. This, this is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment. So that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God. For which indeed you are suffering. So he's talking about God's people suffering. God's people enduring persecution. And there is tons of it in our world today. And then it says, for after all, and here it is, this is tough. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. And to give relief to you who are afflicted 
and to us as well. When the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution, retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These, here it is, ah, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. Wow. Did you get that? The curtain will come down on your neighbor. The curtain will come down on the people around you that you know who are not saved. God is patient, but there will come a day when it's too late. And so we need to understand that. I think it needs to move us. It needs to move us to activity. It needs to move us to action. It needs to move us to involvement. It needs to move us away from passivity and into action as a church family. That if the church is the pillar and the support of the truth, we need to be doing that. And next week, I'm going to talk to fathers. I hope I'll do it kindly. Uh, but it's really, really important that in our culture, fathers are doing what God called fathers to do. So that's next week. Um, <clears throat> so God is patient towards sinners, but his patience will run out. Jesus commanded. Jesus didn't just suggest, but Jesus commanded that we go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus commanded that we go with the gospel. I would just say this, that God was patient with Israel. God, amazingly, was patient with his own people, with the people of Israel. Um, I already mentioned 120 years in the building of the ark, and that was before uh, the nation of Israel was started. But then if, you, if you've been studying our lesson on uh, the Bible survey, you know that during the period of the divided kingdom in Israel after Rehoboam uh, was involved in the split of the nation, we know that <clears throat> there were uh, 19 kings in the northern kingdom, 20 in the south. None in the northern kingdom were good. None of them were godly. None of them followed the Lord. And there were 20 kings in the south, and eight of them were considered or labeled as good. Uh, so uh, the divided kingdom. But during that period of time, if you read your Old Testament, you will read it from the, the mouths of the prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Amos, you know, all of them, and, and most of them, God was being patient with his people, really patient. And he was saying, um, you know, Bruce Wilkinson used to say, shape up or ship out. He was, they were warning the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, warning them that judgment was coming, that exile was coming. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, finally, and I, I, I just want to share if I can find it real quick, I, I printed off a little bit of information about that. Um, So we, we can call that the uh, diaspora, the spreading, the scattering of God's people in judgment. Eventually, this is what happened in the northern kingdom. Uh, 
It says, after Solomon's death, his kingdom broke in two. The northern kingdom of Israel sunk deeper into idolatry and immorality. Jeroboam, the first king of the divided Israel, established a pattern of apostasy, of falling away from faith. Epitaphs for succeeding kings regularly recorded the deceased ruler did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam. That's what was going on there. And Assyria, Assyria conquered the northern kingdom in 722 BC and took over 27,000 Israelites into exile as had been predicted according to 1723. They were settled in cities along the tributaries of the Euphrates River and in Media. Assyrians from cities around Babylon in turn colonized Israel. So that's the northern kingdom. That is not a good thing. 27,000 were carted off because of their idolatry, because of their sinfulness, because of this falling away by their leaders, they were carried off into exile, 722 BC. The southern kingdom uh, of Judah suffered exile to the east in Babylonia and to the south in Egypt. The Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar captured Judeans in several expeditions from 605 BC to the fall of Jerusalem in 586 BC. The first deportation to Babylon took Jerusalem's treasures from the temple and the palace and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and all the smiths uh-oh. <laughs> they took all the smiths. There's a lot of them, i got to tell you. <laughs> anyway, I think Joanne woke up. Uh, uh, craftsmen and the smiths, none remained except the poorest people of the land. And uh, you can go on. So God's curtain fell on his own people, but after Many, many prophets wrote and spoke and preached and warned and warned and warned, but God's judgment did come and it did fall. So uh, that's one thing. There is a little bit more. I hope I can find this. Um, so Jesus... The Savior was born, the incarnation, Jesus was born, just like the prophet said, in Bethlehem, on and on. He lived, he performed many miracles, many signs, many ways that he authenticated himself before the people, you know, and all of that. The light was shining but the light went out on the nation. And in AD 70, I hope I can find this, in AD 70, there was a war that took place, the final war between the Romans and the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. And, uh, boy, I hope I can grab this. It's tucked away here somewhere. Uh, anyway, I don't know what to say. We'll talk about that another day. All we know is that the Romans came and they eventually destroyed the temple, the temple worship. They defeated the Jews. They wreaked havoc on the nation of Israel and defeated them. And... Um, it was a huge thing. Um, but that was in the year AD 70. Okay, that was in the year AD 70. But even though the curtain fell on the nation of Israel because of their rejection of Christ, even though Jesus hid himself, even though Jesus went to the cross, even though he suffered, even though he uh, was crucified, and the nation cried out, crucify him. They rejected him officially as a nation. Even though they did that, 
Turn with me to the book of Acts for a minute. Even before the hammer of judgment fell on the people of God in um, AD 70, I want you to just look with me for a minute here at Acts chapter um, 1. Because even then, there was grace. There was God's amazing patience. Uh, because on the day of Pentecost, um, in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, we know, and I love this passage because Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, on the day of Pentecost, began preaching. And he says in verse 14, but Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk. And he gave his interpretation of the events on the day of Pentecost, of course, but Peter stood and preached. And then if you look at chapter 1, turn back just a little bit to 114, it says, These all with one accord were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons, was there and said, Brethren, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas and so on. So this is 120. And then you have Peter preaching the gospel. And look at chapter 2, verse 37. Um, now, when they had, when they heard this sermon, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each one of, let each, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, he saved, sorry, be saved from this perverse generation. And verse 41, so then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about what? 3,000 souls. This is 40 years before AD 70 or so. Okay? And then look at uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 4. Um, but, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about how many? 5,000. So even before the hammer of judgment fell on the nation of Israel, many Jews came to faith in Christ. Many did. So God was still giving them an opportunity. So I just want to say that God was patient with Israel. I believe the scriptures teach that God will again deal with the nation of Israel. Uh, and he will again, they will again be grafted in and his program with them will continue but we can argue that later um, so i would just say this god is patient with those who are perishing god is patient with those who are not yet saved one of the biggest words in my mouth is you might hate god you may not believe in god you may be living a life that is opposed to god and you're not saved yet my biggest word is yet. We don't know. Some of you know the story that Dr. Hendricks prayed for his father. He was a military guy, and he would always say, my father laid down stripes and I saw stars. 
He was a disciplinarian. He was not a godly man. He was not a believer. He was not that kind of a father. He taught him a lot of things, but he did not teach them teach him faith. And so Howard Hendricks, of course, some of you know his story, but he taught and taught and taught for many years, and he prayed for his dad. He prayed that he would come to faith in Christ. He prayed for his dad for 36 or 39 years. I can't remember. Did you hear me? 30, let's say 36 years of praying for his dad. And we don't know, but his dad, one day out of the blue, and it's an amazing story of how it all transpired, but one day his dad called Howard and says, well, son, I did it. <laughs> I mean, after you prayed for 36 years for someone and it finally happens, I mean, you're going to say, well, you did what? <laughs> I could think of a lot of things that you did, but I was not expecting God, his sovereign move in the life of his dad. Um, and we can't make God do what he's doing. But with his dad, his dad called him and said, son, just want you to know, I am now under a new commanding officer. I'm now under the command of the Lord Jesus. And I, I don't know what Dr. Hendricks said at that point, but, you know. So I just want to say God is patient with those who are per perishing. And sometimes our patience is not the same as God's patience. So I think that's enough lessons from this. I think all I want to say is that at the close of Jesus' public ministry, John tells us that he gave one final invitation to believe. One final, and Jesus did. Jesus called people to faith. Jesus called people to believe. And then he hid himself from them. And as far as the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, the national unbelief of Israel, that was the light went out for them as a nation. And um, so um, I think the question that we need to always ask is, am I patient with people? Do I have a yes face or do I have a dill pickle face, a face of judgment with people? Um, do I pray for people? And I think the conclusion I always come back to is that God, I think the church must be engaged and involved in the ministry to other people, to be reaching out to children, to be reaching out to our teenagers, to be reaching out to senior citizens, to be reaching out to those around us who don't know Christ, because I think that at some point, the curtain will fall on that person's life, those kids' lives, those teenagers' lives. And that's a big deal. So let's pray. Father, <clears throat> I pray that you would do business in my heart, in our heart. Uh, Lord, that you would give us passion, that you would move us to action for the sake of those who are outside of the kingdom of God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see people, to love people, to invite people. We can't save them. There's nothing we can do to save anybody. But God, you have, we are your co-laborers. We are your preachers. We are those who can live lives that bring glory and honor to you. We, we can live lives that adorn the message. We can live lives that beautify the doctrine and i pray lord that you would cause us to live that way this week help us to live in a way that brings you honor and glory and uh, lord I, as you bring people into our lives i pray that you would use us not only to love them but also to tell them the truth about christ and uh, we we prayed at the beginning of today that you would be glorified lord we're going to we're going to be looking at that period in your life when it's a period of conference a period of meeting with your disciples a 
a, a period of the high priestly prayer, a, a period of the trials and the, the mock trials that you went through and the crucifixion and the burial and all of those things are coming. And Lord, I, I just really pray that more than anything, everyone in this room, anyone in this room who is still wavering in unbelief, still holding out some kind of, uh, I don't know, just waiting. Uh, Lord, I pray that today they would call upon you. They would humble themselves before you and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to put their faith, to put their confidence and their trust in him. Lord, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for paying the penalty. Thank you that what you went through satisfied, it propitiated the just demands of a holy God. Thank you for all of that, God. Um, anyway, thank you for the word of God. Um, Lord, this week, we pray that everything we do would be to your honor and to your glory and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we pray in Christ's name, amen.